just practicing my dancing for my Midsummer Night's Dream mask in honor of today's episode. Now, I know last episode I spent a lot of time talking about the enduring power of Romeo and Juliet, but actually, A Midsummer Night's Dream is Shakespeare's most often performed play. And it's no wonder why. It's fun and funny and complex. This comic fantasy about four lovers who get bewitched by fairies in the forest. Now, it was written around 1595, we think for an aristocratic wedding, and we also think it was a hit. But by the time the theaters had reopened after the Puritan era, mm. around 1660, at a public performance, Member of Parliament Samuel Pepys, mm. yes, it's weirdly pronounced Pepys, described it as the most ridiculous play he ever saw. Oh, snap. Perhaps people agreed with him because it wasn't performed in its entirety again until 1840. Oh. Now, composers love A Midsummer Night's Dream, not just for adaptation into opera, but for incidental music, which is music that plays between the scenes in a straight play. Now, we've probably all been to a wedding and heard Mendelssohn's famous wedding march. <laughs> at the end and the recessional. Now Mendelssohn wrote that music for his Midsummer Night's Dream orchestral suite. So I think this is the perfect time to get out our Shakespeare hotline and reach out to an expert for some more exploration as to why this is such an enduring and most often performed play. Hi Angela, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you doing? I'm so happy to speak with you. You're an actor, a writer, and an educator, and uh, a longtime uh, actor with A Noise Within, our classic uh, yes. theater company, and you've also performed yeah. in Midsummer Night's Dream. Yes, I've, I've played Hermia twice um, with the Kingsman Shakespeare Company up in Thousand Oaks. So you will be well poised to answer some questions about the show, uh, the first of which is, why is Midsummer? Shakespeare's most often performed play. Midsummer has everything. It's so fun. It has love and comedy and um, magic. And it really appeals to the whole family while also looking at themes that are higher level and big questions about the nature of love and what love does to us that I think we just can't get enough. We have these kind of multiple worlds colliding. We've got this kind of courtly world, and then we have the world of the lovers who go into the forest, and then we have the fairies themselves in the forest. So how does, how does Shakespeare tell these different stories all at the same time in a unique way? Shakespeare really uses, and I'm gonna use the term scansion, which sounds fancy, but it's just the way that he writes his, his verse, whether it's, um, prose, which is just kind of how I'm talking right now, or it's poetry, which we know what poetry is, and the way that he manipulates it to create really distinct worlds. Shakespeare uses his language to demonstrate the difference between um, all of these different characters. So our poor mechanicals, our, you know, sort of ho-hum folks, they speak in prose. They speak just like we do. They're the regular folks. And then our courtly lovers, they speak um, in iambic pentameter, which is the heartbeat. Da, 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 da. And we as the audience, like we know in our bones that everything's gonna be okay because Shakespeare uses this really awesome thing called a rhyming couplet. And the rhyming couplet um, helps us feel like everything's gonna be okay. So for example, um, Helena says, Lysander, if you live, good sir, awake. He responds, and run through fire, I, I will for thy sweet sake. So we have awake and sake. Right. And that just gives us, it just feels good, right? It just feels good when there's a rhyme and we feel like, oh, that's a nice blanket. So they're in trouble right now, but but everything's going to be okay. Like when you watch a rom-com and you know at the end, everything's going to be okay. So you can kind of enjoy the drama of the middle. Right. And then the coolest part, I think, is the fairy creatures oh. and where the lovers are speaking in iambic pentameter. Our fairies speak in this thing called trochaic tetrometer. Sounds yeah. fancy. All it means is that we're reversing the heartbeat, right? So where 
our iambic pentameter went bump bum, soft hard, that the trochaic is the reverse. It's hard soft, hard soft. And instead of doing five, we're only doing four. So we've got captain of our fairy band. Helena is here at hand. So where the iambic pentameter is instinctively human, the heartbeat, the trochaic tetrometer switches it. So we know, oh, we've got something magical happening here. And it's just like really spooky and fun. And it's, and it's great and it works and it helps us navigate those worlds and it's super fun. I can't thank you enough. It was so awesome to learn about Scansion and, and how uh, the musicianship of Shakespeare's language tells the story of the characters. My head is exploding with the brilliance. It's so great. Uh, he was a smart guy. He knew something. He knew something. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Bye, Angela. Bye. Bye. Henry Purcell was a 17th century composer who was widely considered to be one of the greatest English composers of all time. He wrote in the height of what we call the Baroque style. Now, during this time, opera, which is sung all the way through, had become wildly popular in Italy, but it hadn't really caught on in England. Instead, the English created what are called masks, this kind of courtly entertainment that involves singing, acting, dancing, and music. So here comes Henry Purcell, and he sort of turns this form on its head, writing semi-operas in which the spoken dialogue becomes kind of a dramatic framework for these extended musical scenes which then comment on the storytelling of the play. Purcell wrote The Fairy Queen in 1692, and he loosely based it on A Midsummer Night's Dream, sort of like how when you see a movie and it says, inspired by true events, but he adapted it to create room for these extended musical scenes or masks. In many ways, it's like a modern day musical more than an opera. Oh, Let Me Weep is a plaint sung in the last act by Juno, the goddess of marriage, which doesn't really have anything to do with A Midsummer Night's Dream, but she tells the lovers to be faithful, warns against jealousy, and then laments, oh, let me weep for he is gone and I shall see him no more. Who is she talking about? We have no idea. Thanks again for joining me on another exploration of Shakespeare's brilliance in music. 
Now next week, things are going to get a little ugly as we explore one of Shakespeare's darker works. I'm Katherine Powers. I'll see you next Thursday for another episode of Shakespeare Sings. Ah!